The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashville Mental Health. The Empower Hour will provide information and support about mental health, substance use, and behavioral health. Our goal is to share inspiring stories about transforming lives, to strike down stigma, and to encourage our community to reach out and get help when needed. Mental health is part of all of our lives. It's time we talk about it. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, President and CEO of Greater Nashville Mental Health, and it's time to get empowered. Welcome to the Empower Hour with Greater Nashua Mental Health. I'm Dr. Cynthia Whitaker, the President and CEO at Greater Nashua, and we're delighted to have you here with us today. We're recording this in May, which is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we are delighted that this month we are able to have with us a person with lived experience who is a peer support specialist with us at Greater Nashua Mental Health. Welcome, Nick Perricone. Thanks, Cynthia, for having me on. Oh, I'm so delighted that we're here today to talk about the importance of having people with lived experience or peers as part of people's treatment and what that can mean for people. So I'd love if you could just start with how you got here. You know, what's part of your story that brought you to being a peer support specialist? So, yeah, um, thanks. I guess, like, it started um, for me in college, uh, like, I... I started to have some some mental health difficulties around my senior year, I guess. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up kind of like turning in some papers late, taking some incompletes, but I managed to graduate. Um, but I got home and, um, and things just kind of, um, I, I was stuck for a while and mm -hmm. um, I ended up kind of being hospitalized and just spending like a lot of time in my 20s, just really kind of struggling, um, feeling really overwhelmed and um, just trying to cope with it the best I can. Not always, you know, the um, healthiest coping strategies, but um, but what, what changed it, What well, a few things changed it for me. One was, you know, the care I got from therapists, clinicians, and then another part was finding a bunch of people who had been through similar things that I had been through. And it was like, it was this moment I had where it was like, wow, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Like there are, there are people a lot like me, just like me really, um, who are, who are moving forward in their lives, who are, who are, you know, transforming themselves and, and, um, and that's called peer support when when we kind of help each other do that. And um, so finding discovering that was was an important piece of my journey. So having that knowledge and that support of there are people like you on that journey who'd been where you'd been, and then learn tools to improve their mental wellness and continue to thrive. Would, would you call it inspiring? It sounds like maybe it inspired you. It was inspiring, yeah. Um, it it was uh, it was almost refreshing too. It was like mm. um, you know, hearing perspectives of people who had actually been through the system and and who had who had really Im improved their lives and who had, um, like you said, learned the tools to kind of um, to come through these things. And um, it was inspiring, definitely. And you know. Um, it, a lot of it was in person at peer support centers and at recovery meetings, and um, and some of it was online too. Mm -hmm. um, found some peer support resources online, and it was very inspiring. Yeah. What I, what I love about what you just sort of brought up was how there's a, a continuum of peer support, right? So some might be online, some might be in formal meetings, yeah. some might just be in going to a center or peer support agency for help. Yep. Um, it sounds like you utilized all of all of those. I I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> um, over the years, you know, yeah. it, not all at once. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of had to dip my feet in a little bit at first, get comfortable just with maybe one peer support center. But the more I I realized, I really loved it. I really 
I've met some just really amazing people mm. through peer support and um, the more I wanted to keep doing it and the more I found it was benefiting me, the more I just wanted to keep, keep doing it. So. so you get involved, you dip your toe in more and more, you like it. And then you ended up working at a peer support agency? Yeah, that's, that... that's what happened. Um, I guess I, I stuck around and, um, you know, started to create relationships with people, um, just peer to peer, just, mm -hmm. um, just being with people. Um, I would try, I would try to go every day. Um, cause at the time I, I wasn't working obviously. And I, I had a lot of time, so I would kind of spend my time going going to peer, the peer support center and mm -hmm. and um, and volunteering, helping out where I could, whether it was you know with the garden or um, you know doing check ins, um, different kind of activities they do at the center, and um, and then they asked me if I wanted to start working, and um, and I was excited, and they they um, they offered me training, peer support trainings, which um, which were just um, so important to my um, professional development. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, I could I could talk more about the trainings because like they've like they've really I think um, the trainings I received through the state from and while I was at the Peer Support Center Hearts, um, I think they're they're um, they prepared me for what I'm doing now mm. uh, on the ACT team mm -hmm. at Greater National Mental Health, um, doing peer support specialist work, um, the intentional peer support core training. It, it, it you know it was nothing less than life changing. You know to learn the intentional peer support framework and to apply it to my life and to my relationships. Um, and of course, RAP and WAM and the different trainings that peer support specialists get. But um, yeah. So I, I think some people might not realize that just like, you know, therapists or people that are trained like I am have certain models that we use with clients. Peer support has models and trainings too. So I think that's really important that you you brought that up because I don't, I don't think everybody realizes. Right. It's not like, you know, just some guy from the street, you know, that we're going to have, you know, hire to support people. It's no, we've been, us, we peers have been trained, um, you know, um, we have, um, you know, skills, peer support skills, and we we're, we draw from our lived experience to, to support our, the people we work with, but, you know, we've been trained in, in, um, in, in different peer support modalities mm -hmm. that have, you know, mm -hmm. been shown to be effective. All right. How, um, did, how, did, how to support somebody in the most effective way, in the way that helps them the most possible, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, and one, like, one of the things that makes peer support kind of different is it's like, it's, it's not just about the individual, like, um, it's about the relationship that you form with people. So, mm -hmm. like, um, it's, I, I would say it's about us. It's not just about any, like me or the person I'm working with. It's about what we can do together, what, how we can use the relationship as a vehicle for transformation or, or change or recovery. But one of the reasons why it was really important to me to kind of highlight peer support soon, like this is only our fifth episode of the show, was I really feel like there's something very empowering when people engage with peer support. There is, yeah. I think, um, you know, self-care is great and can go a long way, but we also need to take care of each other. We need community care. And I think peer support, um, you, you can kind of look at it as just mutual aid, just people mm -hmm. taking care of each other and um, sharing what they've learned and, um, and, you know, drawing from their lived experience and, and it's very empowering, you know. Um, like, like it, just just to know you're not alone, I think, is empowering. Yeah. Um, at least for me, it was because, um, you know, I, I've I've been you know diagnosed with psychosis and schizophrenia and like some scary words, um, like when you're when you're going through that and you feel like, 
I must be the only one who out there who who's going through this. And then you find, no, there are people all around you, just like you, who have gone through some of what you've gone through or a lot of what you've gone through. And, um, and they're doing fine. They're doing well, actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, that can be empowering for sure. Right. To, to, to realize treatment can work and, yeah. you know, getting skills and using them, even though it's not always easy, can be successful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to like take charge of that too, like mm. not just to be sort of like a, like a recipient of it, but to like be, to own your own, however you want to call it. I, I use the word recovery, um, but some people use different language, but like to own, to own your experience and, you know, um, to that's to me, like that's empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like we're, we're accountable, we're responsible. So a, a therapist, a treatment provider, even a peer can, can give us advice or suggest it certain things mm -hmm. but really we're each individually responsible for figuring out how to move it forward and and you know that's part of um the, the peer support modalities i use personal responsibility is a key concept in rap accountability is one of the co uh, competencies in ips intentional peer support so mm -hmm. yeah um yeah absolutely so what does it look like for you now so you you said we're um, you're a peer support specialist now at Greater National Mental Health on our ACT team, which yep. is our assertive community treatment team. So yep. how is that the same or different from what you did when you worked at the peer support agency? That's a really good question. It's, it's different um, in that, I guess, um, it, intentional peer support, which I'm trained in, as I said, is... Um, it's almost more akin to community organizing than providing a service. It's it's you know mutuality is one of the is one of the key t is tasks of intentional peer support. Um, so it's been an interesting experience, like applying that to a clinical setting where I I am providing a service and um, and and learning to navigate that and, and negotiate the power imbalances that that kind of creates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's different when, you know, you're sort of in a, a setting where you're all kind of there, you're all kind of going there for support and you're all looking for the same thing. But um, on a on an ACT team, it's, it's different. You know, um, some folks are there, you know, because they're court ordered to be engaging in treatment. And, um, you know, as a peer, I want to, level the you know the power imbalances as much as i can because peer is means equal to me it's right. we're equals um we're learning together um so um so even the idea of like providing a service is almost like um it's tricky when you when you're working in peer support but luckily i mean honestly i've had a lot of support from the whole act team and from the whole agency in terms of like um, allowing the people, the peers, the lived, people with lived experience to really define what peer support is and how it's going to look in a clinical setting. That's, yeah. um, I almost feel like it's both a, a blessing and a curse at the same time, right? Like, yeah, we, we've allowed you to create it and, oh, and you have to create it, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but... Um, but it, it's more of a blessing, I would say. Oh, come on, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Because I, I do think, I think our system as a whole in this state hasn't, we know we need peers. We can see how impactful they are on folks that are coming for our services and who are experiencing challenges with their mental wellness. But we haven't done a very good job of defining that, you know, that conflict you were just talking about. Well, how how do I stay in equal and mutual when I'm providing a service? Exactly. Um, and and so I I think we need to rely on you know people that have the experiences like you that have been in both settings to help us say, okay, how do we make this work? Um, because we want the benefits. And we are doing it in a clinical setting. Yeah, but it, it, the the cool thing is it works pretty well, I think, from what I've seen. You yeah. know, 
the clinical support and the peer support working together, you know, when there's mutual respect between the, the peers and the clinicians. And um, I think it, it can be actually a really great thing. And for the people we serve, too, mm -hmm. um, I think. Um, Do you have any examples of where you've seen kind of the yourself as the peer or even one of the other peers working alongside with a clinician to like really bring about a better outcome for a client? Um, maybe even multiple examples probably pop into your head. Um, just, you know, if I can be an advocate, um, that's, you know, we're all advocates. You know, I work with a team of advocates, but, you know, if I, um, if I sort of feel like I have a perspective, like I, I've been working really closely with someone, I can sort of, um, you know, uh, speak for them in, in team meetings and, and try to um, advocate for, for their goals in, in the treatment. Um, um, I think, but like I said, I work with a team of advocates. I'm, I'm not the only one doing that. Um, mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all trying to do that. And, um, but I think, um, you know, people, uh, you know, respect when I'm honest and and mutual with them, you know, that people open up to me. So, um, and then to try to just, you know, um, preserve that relationship and, um, and, and to try to use that relationship for, for, you know, to help them with their goals, what they want to work on, what they want to move towards. One of the things I've, I've heard and I've also observed is sometimes people who are resistant to help and maybe maybe they have a symptom of mental illness that makes them not realize they have a mental illness, mm -hmm. right? Some of our more severe illnesses, that's a symptom. Um, that th they are able to find a way to engage often the initial treatment or that initial step um, with a peer more than with a clinician. Mm. Um, so it kind of helps people maybe dip in that toe, like you were talking about, even for yourself, yep. Um, yep. maybe. Do, do you have a sense of why that is, or have you observed the same thing? I can, you know, I can even say for myself, I, you know, when I'm sick, I don't know I'm sick. It's sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and when I was going through, you know, what I was telling you about in my 20s and throughout, you know, some of that time in my life, I, um, it was a gradual kind of, like, coming to terms with, with what was going on, with, um, with how, I, I don't think of it as an illness, but how I'm different, how I, how I perceive the world and how I um, am in the world. But um, I think peers can definitely be a bridge for, for, for people um, in, in terms of um, treatment. And I think it's maybe because we, we don't, um, we're not, basing our our models on on diagnosis or or psychiatric models it's about connection and mm -hmm. um and that could mean like you know you know what kind of music do you like or you know um connecting through experiences rather than symptoms um, mm -hmm. we relate to each other based on experiences not symptoms so um i think that makes it easier for somebody to be like yeah like um in, for me at least um I was able to open up more mm. when I, when people were just sort of relating to me like a, from human to human um, and not from like an expert provider to like a client kind of relationship. One, one of the things I think that the mental health field has a history of, you know, if you go pre-1960s, there weren't community mental health centers. There weren't community providers. Right. If you had challenges with mental wellness, you were hospitalized. And right. so I think a lot of people fear the clinician is going to hospitalize them, is going to, yeah. you know, label them and put them away. And, you know, there's still a lot of that that kind of lingers in fear instead of really understanding there's a lot of different ways people can get support and help with whatever they're dealing with. I mean, many people don't even need the help of a Clinician, and then for other disorders, certainly we want people to have that help because you know there's skills that we can give people. So, mm -hmm. yeah, kind of interesting to think about. Yeah, it is. Um, 
I think you you said it right. There's there's this fear, this sort of um, double bind that you know patients are in, where we have to be honest to get help. But if we're honest about some of our symptoms, it can you know we can there can be consequences like losing our freedom. Mm-hmm. But it's not like you know. I think the system has changed. I yeah. I don't know what it was like. You know, I, I'm 31. When I went through my hospitalizations, it was like um, it was it was not at a time when sort of like some of those old messages like, you know, you have to limit what you, your goals and your hopes are. Like I, I didn't, I was never told like, you can't go back to work or like you That's can't true. get a job. Like, um, so I think, you know, things have, times have changed and, mm. and, uh, but yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Mm. Um, so that helps with that bridge because it, I think the most important thing is that peers don't judge. Mm -hmm. But as a clinician, I'm almost forced to judge, right? You said I have to come with a diagnosis and what are those symptoms? And, you know, so it just has a different feel to it. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And both can be helpful in my Mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to speak for everyone, but in my experience, both have been really helpful. Um, But I've needed both. I I couldn't just have one without the other. Um, uh, I need that that connection, and I also need medication. And and like, yeah, my diagnosis has helped me access support, which mm-hmm. I need, and and even peer support. You know, to connect with other people who have the same diagnosis or have been through similar kind of challenges. Um, so yeah, mm. one of the things we've danced around a little bit that's come up a couple of different times is language. Yeah. Right. You said you you don't think of it as an illness. Yeah. Right. And I think other people, it gives them comfort to call it an illness. And Mm -hmm. I know language is part of the intentional peer support model. So I'd I'd love your your thoughts on how how important the language we use is. It's um, in in IPS, they say language creates reality, like Mm -hmm. the way we talk about something really it affects how we how we treat it, how we view it, and and how we respond to it. Um, I think clinical language is is a tool that can be really effective when you're working in a clinical setting to communicate and to advocate and to you know treat the people we work with. Um, and then I think it also has limitations, and it it can pigeonhole or it does pigeonhole people. And I think um, my job, my role on the team, is to sort of shake things up a little bit and, and say, you know, hey, is there another way we could we could frame how we're talking about this person and what they're going through? And um, and when I, and then when I say that, then it leads to a conversation where, well, what are we trying to say and how are we serving this person, this person's needs? And I think it makes me a better peer. And I think it it I hope it helps the clinicians kind of um, be more precise about what we're trying to accomplish. And I, I, I don't know, it's one of my favorite parts about working on an ACT team is having those conversations, mm. you know. Um, and I, what I hear when you talk about that is it's not that it's like a right or wrong. It's mm-hmm. not like there's this, you know, thou shalt never say these words. It's more what's the intention or the purpose of the conversation. Exactly. Right? So if I got to write a report, well, I got to write a diagnosis. But if we're having a conversation, do we need to refer to that person by their diagnosis? Of course not. Right. Right? And yeah, exactly. I, um, I, there's no right or wrong. Um, you know, I, it, it, And it's not like, you know, I do advocate for certain recovery-based language, but it's not like we just replace one set of terms with another and that makes everything okay. That that wouldn't really, it's more about the intention, like you said. Um, And then also how, when we talk to the people we work with, you know, not to use jargon, not to use, to make sure we're, we're on the same page kind of, and, and we're using language that each person understands and finds respectful. That's another thing I, you know, I'm, um, advocating for and and you know peer support has its own jargon you know which mm-hmm. we have to be careful not to not to use when when working with people but uh, well yeah not to not to use that jargon yeah. I guess. Um, yeah yeah it, it it just makes me think too about there's a lot of respect 
for people or compassion, non-judgment is what, what I hear. And so like instead of assuming somebody understands my jargon, maybe making sure is it okay if we use this word or what word would you prefer we use or you know just kind of giving people that that ability to identify for themselves exactly and i think for any group of people we we want to pay them that respect like to to define how they want to be talked about how what respect means to us mm-hmm. um you know i think it's yeah um yeah it's just really, it's really important. Just the language and the compassion and the non-judgment, it's just really important. So if, if somebody's watching, listening right now, who's either struggling themselves or maybe is a family member of somebody who's struggling, what, what might you say to them? Like, is there something somebody could learn from all of your experience? When I was struggling, I just wanted somebody to, to, to empathize with me, to, to, to listen to me and to just be there with me in my pain. And um, that's what I try to tell people when, when someone says, hey, I, this person's struggling, how do I help them? And, and, and normalize it because we all go through struggles. And, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, I, I, I do want people to know that there is help out there and it doesn't mean you're going to get locked up. Um, and, and, you know, the more we can c- take care of each other in a community, as a community, um, we're all going to be better off. Um, you know, um, and, and just use what resources are available to you. Um, and there's a lot out there that people might not know about. A lot of people don't even know that we have peer support agencies or respite, mm-hmm. crisis respite centers, peer respite centers um, as alternatives to kind of hospitalization and other you know, things that people want to avoid. Um, so, yeah, so. Um, in, in there I heard not jumping to fixing. Right. Right. There, there. You started with like the empathize and like because exactly. I, and I know, I know, as a f- parent or a family member, that's hard for families because, you know, I'm sure your parents didn't want to see you in pain and they wanted to figure out how to help, but yep. yet you were also like, can can somebody just acknowledge this is hard? Right. right? Yeah. No. Exactly. Um, you said it. Um, you. you that's something that I hear in trainings a lot is you don't want to just jump right to problem solving or mm-hmm. to try to fix the situation, although that is our nature. We mm-hmm. want to make things better for people. But really, you know, I, I just try to speak from my experience. Like, yeah, I wanted someone to acknowledge that, you know, things were I was in a tough place. And um, and and I think peer support can can give you that sort of um, validation that you're not alone and yeah. um, and so can so can anyone you know anyone can do that um, yeah what what I know is we're giving a name to something that's always been right and we've always known has helped right um, and I think there are also a lot of people who are in the field that are of you know, a generation, my generation, or even that were, you know, a generation older than I, who are in the field because of lived experience, mm-hmm. but yeah. never told anybody, mm-hmm. right? And it's, it's, it's kind of refreshing to know we can talk about it. You can still provide help and services, and in fact, maybe even better help and services to individuals because of your experience yeah it doesn't have to be this binary right like you're either sick or you're well and like um it's more of a spectrum and we're kind of moving moving around on it every day in in different ways and um you know i think that binary is sort of reinforced to us like um i i i was you know reading this article i think it was by sasha de but he was saying like 
when we go into a, a waiting office for a doctor, it's like there used to be the sick waiting room and the well waiting room, you know? So it's sort of, we get this message like it's one or the other, but it's not. And um, yeah, you, you can totally, you still have something to offer. Helping people, you know, even if you are sick or even if you are struggling, you still have something to offer. And I think, like, I think that that in and of itself is beneficial to people to to be able to help other people, to give back, right. you know. Um, right. One way to support your mental wellness is to have connections and giving back to other people. Right. So if we make that different, you know, that, as you said, binary, well, if I'm sick, I can't help people, then you might miss an opportunity to work on your wellness. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's certainly not not something we want we want to give everybody as many tools as they can exactly to work on their wellness and i i think you know supported employment's another place where that comes up yeah. you know i mean you said you were lucky enough to not have gotten that message of well you'll never work but sadly many people have right gotten that message and and that's just not true no it's not um supported employment it's it's an evidence-based practice right you know mm -hmm. it, it works and um, and, you know, it, it's not like it, it doesn't have to be a recovery job either. It can be what you really want to do and what right. you're passionate about. And, um, right. It could be in computers or cooking or wh whatever, whatever exactly. anybody has a passion for. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's the other thing that I really appreciate about intentional peer support is it's, it's positive focused. Mm hmm right? Like it's not, let's not deficiency focus. Right. Like a lot of clinical work, even when, even though we try to be positive, right? I mean, to get paid, we got to give somebody a diagnosis to, mm -hmm. you know, substantiate the need for services. We got to talk about all the things you can't do, mm -hmm. you know, and then usually there'll be a little, okay, what are your strengths? And it's this, you know, one or two sentences instead of you know, tell me what your superpower is. What are you really good at? And, yeah. You know, building from there. Um, yeah. Because personally, kind of having observed you, I think your superpower is connecting with people. Thanks. <laughs> because, it, in, and just making people feel seen and heard. I try, you know, that's... Um, I, yeah, I want people to feel comfortable and feel like they can talk to me and um, and it, it helps me, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But I also work with some really talented clinicians who are also really good at connecting with people. Mm -hmm. It's not, lived experience isn't a prerequisite for connection. It, it, it can be something that you can draw from that can help, but um, yeah, I know clinicians who don't have lived experience who can, are still really good at connecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, one of, uh, one of the things I recently heard, because a lot of our models are, you know, empirically supported treatments or empirically based treatments are often created by therapists or in a you know, in a lab setting or, right. you know, maybe even in front of a green screen, who knows, right? Um, and it's sort of like, well, there really shouldn't be any empirically based treatment that doesn't have the perspective of lived experience in it. Yeah. Like if I give you, what does it feel like to go through our intake? What does it feel like? How, what is your experience of that? And that's another piece that I'm really hoping we can do more of in our field is, really take the feedback from people that have gone through and, you know, what parts felt good and what parts felt icky. And not that everybody has the same experience and, you know, we should change everything because of one person's experience, but there's a lot of value there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I, I hope to see people with lived experience being involved in research and mm -hmm. providing services and, um, and just a shift to, to valuing the lived experience like you're talking about, um, to see that it is valuable and that, um, and that, you know, it doesn't really make sense to design a service for somebody and not include like the people who are receiving it and, um, you know, um, 
yeah, um, I think I think a lot of I, I think we're moving in that direction. I hope. And, yeah, we um, are. Yeah, and and I, I really appreciate the and it and it's not either or. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe for some people, one is better than the other, and they only need one or the other. But that both are needed for many people, and both have, you know, both peer support and more traditional clinical services. But you know, they can be better together. Yes. Right. I, yeah. I think that's what your your experience on the ACT team. That is. That is. Has. That's what it's. I've. I've learned or come to believe because you know maybe before this I was a little bit like, you know, peer support is is really what's helped me, and that's, you know. Um, there can, you know, like, like clinical work that's bad, but that's not, it's not good or bad. It's just different. It's mm-hmm. um, just two different ways of, of supporting somebody and they're both equally valid and useful and helpful. Right. So. And if we collaborate and work together, it might even be more effective than yes. one or the other. Which, yeah. And that's part of why, you know, Greater Nashville Mental Health does really try as much as we can to collaborate and be supportive of hearts our you know our local peer support agency here in nashua yeah um you know as, as much as is is appropriate for us too right because we also don't want to come in with our clinician and say oh we'll do this because that's it's not our place so we certainly have to be careful but you know how do, how do we collaborate in a way that lets both models be the best they can be yeah yeah absolutely oh, I and love I, it. I think just being with each other just Exit like being with in community with each other is mm-hmm. is going to help with that. Um, just so. yeah, and, and learning more about you know how we got here on both sides. I think mm-hmm. for people understanding that there is research base behind RAP and IPS and yep. you know all the the peer support models. I think helps. It just helps the more people know and the more we communicate about it. Right. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed just talking about peer support with you and, and your journey. And um, one of the questions I always try to end with, though, is like, what's something in your life or something you do currently that empowers you to be the best you can be? Going to meetings, going mm-hmm. to recovery meetings, mm-hmm. um, playing the guitar, listening to music, meditating, exercising. You've got a list of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't pick just one. Oh uh, no, that's great because I think I think that's a perfect example of maybe there isn't just one. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, you know, to really have the best mental wellness you can have, maybe you do need a list to choose from. And maybe some work better today and others work better another day. I mean, have you ever had that kind exactly. of experience? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That that's great. So, what what are your plans for today? What 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 are your what are you gonna do to deep breathe after having been on this show? Oh man! Well, I <laughs> I'm heading back to work after this to finish some things up. But um, actually, I'm I'm gonna meet a friend and we're gonna go for a walk after after Back I get work. off. Yeah. Oh, so. nice. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely a lot of good stuff about being out in nature and Absolutely. movement too. So, well, I, it has been a delight to have you here, and I'm I'm so thankful and grateful that you joined us as one of our first peers at Greater Nashua officially, and you know now we've got so many more. So we. We thank you for taking on that burden, though you say it's a blessing of helping us figure it out. Um, Well, thank you. I'm really grateful to be here and to have had this experience with you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Empower Hour with Greater National Mental Health. We'll see you next time. And for now, have an empowered day. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.